time. Take it away. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, November 1st. Oh my gosh, it's November. For Mastermind Monday, uh, as many of you know, we've been doing this uh, since early part of the pandemic, mostly due to Cheryl DiGiralmo, who's on, our, our immediate past president and whose brainchild this was many moons ago, and to Nora Lynch, who single-handedly, along with Kelly Catalo, almost two years ago now, um, gave us some form to all of this. And we wouldn't be anywhere without our CTO, Christine McClellan, who is always here on the, all of the controls and will be posting today's uh, Mastermind, as she does every week, to our YouTube channel. So my name is Lisa Parento. I'm the president of the New England region of RRC. I'm going to get out of the way to quickly say my announcement is to please save the date. December 2nd, 4 to 5.30 for the New England region uh, installation um, and celebration will be that day virtual again this year. Uh, very excited to share that Elizabeth Mendenhall is going to be um, our keynote speaker and she's speaking on 10 questions all leaders should ask themselves. So we're very excited about that. So please put that on your calendar. Um, believe it or not, you may get an email or two in advance about that. You know how RRC, you know sends out an email every once in a while. So you'll probably get an email from me and RRC about that. I want to make sure that's on there. But let me not waste any more time and welcome Alexis Bolin, who is here from the great state of Florida. And Alexis has been a CRS uh, for since she was about two for many years. But so she was very young, very, very young when she started. Mm -hmm. Um, very, very young when she started in real estate and has a, a real storied career and um, is affectionately known in the CRS world as the queen of scripts. And I was mentioning before we started that, um, you know, it's so it's kind of funny because um, people usually have a love hate relationship with scripts, right? We know they're important. We know they work. We need to stay on task. But everyone will say, I hate scripts. I can't possibly use a script. Um, but Alexis is really uh, has been an advocate of script using for many years. I had the great fortune of hearing her last week at an RRC event that we did called Knowledge Nuggets. And she did a really funny and timely piece on objections. And so I asked her if she would be willing to jump in today and uh, share that with us. And she agreed. So with no further ado, let me turn over to Alexis. And Alexis will give you control if you want to do some uh, PowerPoint, and then we'll come back together uh, about 25 after the hour and um, maybe you can field some questions. I'm, I'll be glad to. And thank you for having me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I apologize for the scratchy voice this morning. The sinuses are bad. You know, we're in Florida. It's still warm here. So I'm going to try to share my screen with you. If I uh, mess it up, that's okay. I'll probably just keep dropping. So let me see if I can get this up and get it started. Well, let's see. All right. So everybody is worried about scripts. And honestly, scripts are just an opportunity to answer questions. That's all they are. I don't know why they're scary to everybody um, because buyers and sellers are looking for answers. And so if you get the right answers or able to answer, then your income is going to be higher because your success depends upon how well you answer their questions. NER did a study of buyers and sellers. 89% consider negotiation to be the most important skill so when you're on a listing presentation, you really need, or talking with buyers, you need to stress your skills. So get permission to be honest with them. I can tell you the truth, or I can tell you what you want to hear. What do you want me to tell you? They've never said lie to me. I've never had that happen in my whole career. And in order to get through to them, you have to get them to buy in what's going on. Can't be your idea. It's got to be their idea. So if you ask enough questions, you can get them to come around and come to the conclusion that they need to do one thing or another, and then they feel good about it, and it's their idea. So I always say, well, what do you think about it? So many times they say to me, and I know they do to you too, buyers are looking at houses, well, what do you think about it? Well, quite honestly, I'm not going to live there. And I've sold a lot of houses I wouldn't live in, and I'm sure you have too. Not my area of town, not what I want to do. So I always say, well, what do you think? You tell me first, and then I'll tell you what I think. Then if they tell me, oh, this is the house, we really like it, I say my job is to keep you from stepping on the alligator. If you like it, I love it, and we move on. So don't try to talk them out of something they've picked out because you don't like it. 
be sure that 50% of the conversation, you're asking them questions. You're not doing all the talking and stop and listen to what they're saying because what they're saying to you sometimes has two meanings. You know, it's what they say, it's their body language, it's the inflection in the voice to figure out what they're really talking about. Because we always say buyers are liars. They're not liars. They're just confused. And then we aren't picking up on what it is they're telling us. So how do you do that? I always ask open-ended questions for those of you who know me, you know, this is how I am. So what we learned in school, I never thought I would use these once I got out of grammar school, but who, what, where, when, why, how are we gonna do these things? I love who else is gonna make the decision. If you've ever been out with a first time home buyer, <clears throat> excuse me, and you've looked at all the ugly houses and they picked out two nice ones, parents come along and mix the two nice ones because they didn't get to see the ugly ones. So make sure that you include everybody that's gonna make a decision in looking at all the houses. You gotta know your market better than any agent. I mean, when agents try to say to me, oh, the house is worth blah, 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 or one sold down the street for such and such, no. I negotiate from a, a position of strength because when we're writing an offer, I'm looking up everything. I wanna know everything and anything that's ever happened in that neck of the woods so that I can better help the buyer or the seller, whichever I'm doing. And then understand their true motivation. Not everybody's motivated by money. I'm sure you've had a number of sellers this year that took offers that weren't the highest offer because the other terms were better for them. So don't think it's about the money. It, and so I'm always asking questions. You guys know I'm always curious about everything. So when you're blonde and you're old, you get to be curious. So I'm always curious. Why do you think that way? What causes you to say that? Well, I was just wondering. Well, do you mind if I ask a question? Please tell me more. And do this not only with your buyers and sellers, but with your fellow agents. When you are going to write an offer on an, um, someone's listing, call and get the temperature of the agent as well as the seller. And you do that by asking questions. Same thing, I'm the listing agent, you have the buyer, I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna ask a bunch of questions. So use the questions to soften things and to get more information. I always ask the buyers and the sellers, what do you know about the current market? Because the sellers have been watching HGTV and so have the buyers and they think every house has been renovated or should be. And the seller thinks that, oh, one buyer comes along and that's all you need. And maybe in some cases it is today, but it's not the way it works. The other thing in talking to sellers I'm finding is that the sellers are saying, well, we don't need you. We can just put a sign in the yard and throw our house on Zillow or somewhere, and we're going to be able to sell it without you. Well, anybody can fog the mirror any day of the week. That doesn't mean that it gets to closing. So I, I say to them, we're in a skills market. This is not a seller's market. I've been in buyer's markets, seller's markets. And it doesn't matter what kind of market you're in. All the agents in town have the same tools to work with. So what separates your top producers from the ones who are average or below average is their skill set. Has nothing to do with how many websites I can put your house on. It has nothing to do with how many buyers parade through this house. The work really starts when we go under contract. And then my skill set is what's going to keep the orders in the water and get us to closing without any big hitches. So we are in a skills market. I get paid for what I know and what I know how to do, much like a surgeon does or your CPA or an attorney, uh, because my skill set is different than somebody else's skill set. Now, don't talk bad about your fellow agents. Just talk about your skill set. And my skill set is different. And that's what you need to talk about. What sets you apart? What makes you different? Uh, if your track record, you may be new in the business or you've only been in a year or so, isn't as great as some of the other agents, my company's track record is what I want to stand on. Um, so use that. The other thing is never sell your services based on price. I'm going right back to the skill set. I get paid for what I know and what I know how to do. 
I don't get paid based just on the price of your house. So you need to make sure they know the benefits of your skill set. So use stories to explain how you got rid of the alligator and got somebody to closing when nobody else could do it. Remember too, as I explained to buyers and sellers, prices are fluid. They change on a daily basis because the last closing that happened last week changes our prices in this market. And so it's only a moment in time. It's not a forever, oh, I got an appraisal last year. I hear this all the time. I got an appraisal six months ago and it's blah, blah, blah. Great, wonderful. That was good on the day you got it. I love this one. Another realtor said they could get me a higher price and they're going to charge less. I'm sure this probably doesn't happen in your market, only down here in Pensacola. So go back to Code of Ethics. Realtors in attempting to secure a listing shall not deliberately mislead the owner as to the market value. I'm challenging you to do what I do, grab a copy offline, print it out, stick it in whatever presentation you've got and drag it out when that comes up, which is what I do. And I say, you know, when I got a real estate license 44 years ago, I promised I would live by the code of ethics and here's what it says. I'm not sure some of the agents really understand this is in there and then keep trucking. Things that don't affect value. Now, I don't know about up north, but you know we seem to have 100 pound nails in our walls down here that the sellers want more money for. And anything and everything they do, if they put a coat of paint on the house, that ups the value 10,000 in their minds. So I always wanna to explain to them things that don't affect the value. What you think it's worth, what you paid for, what the other agent said, how much money you need, this is what we get all the time. I'm moving to California. Do you know how expensive the prices are there? And I told one guy years ago, I said, well, if your theory is correct, then don't buy a house in, in California from a guy who's moving to Tokyo because it, that theory doesn't work. So, and what the neighbors think it's worth. I always love that. One of the phrases I love to share with my sellers is, your improvements don't necessarily add value to your property, but they make it more show, showable and more saleable. But it may not cause you to get a lot more money. But if it's nice and neat and cleaned up with a fresh coat of paint, et cetera, it's going to cause the buyer to buy yours first, not to pay you $10,000 more. So some things don't bring a nickel. They just cause it to sell quicker. I love when they're interviewing other agents. As I said, it's important at that point in time to use your skills and explain your skill set to the sellers because they don't know that we're different. God gave us all a real estate license and they have every reason to think we are all the same. So I said to one old dude not too long ago when he said to me, I'm interviewing agents, calls me on the phone, like to make an appointment with you to interview you. And I said to him, gee, I don't know if I can do that. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I don't interview well. I've never been on a job interview in my whole life. So maybe let's do this. I'll just come over to the house and take a look at it. And you and I'll talk. Would that work? He goes, oh yeah. Then the next thing out of his mouth is, what are you going to charge me? And so I said to him, well, I don't know. He goes, what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, I haven't seen your house yet. And he goes, what's that got to do with it? I said, well, if it's ugly, I charge more. So I have some time on Wednesday or Thursday, at blah, blah, blah. What works for you? Let me come over and let's talk. He goes, okay. So, you know, when I call this outrageous, contagious, I really mean, don't be afraid to say things like that. He thought that was funny. And I got an appointment, ended up with a listing because he wanted to know what made me different than another agent. And I told him, darned if I know. But since he interviewed the other agent, why didn't he tell me? And so, you know, he just looked across the dining room table and giggled. And I said to him, look, do you want to list the house with the other agent? You can certainly do that. Or do you want to do paperwork to put it on the market with me today? Because I'm ready to leave if you want me to. And he goes, no, no, I like you. Let's do this. Don't be afraid to do things like that. What was the worst thing that he could do? Tell me to leave? Okay, fine. I don't have a problem with that. So don't operate from scarcity, operate for abundance. And the main thing here on this slide, I, I really want you to write down, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have asked? 
that would help me better understand your situation. Because sometimes we don't always ask everything and there's something in the back of their mind that is bothering them or they need an answer to, but they haven't asked that yet. I love when you take less commission because another agent's going to take less. So I have put together many years ago what I call the commission breakdown sheet. And it shows where the money goes. And this is a typical transaction. Once before I was showing this, I think it's CRS. Somebody in the audience says, well, it doesn't really work that way. Well, who cares? Is this not what happens? There's four people eating the pie. And this is what happens to the money. Whatever numbers you want to put on there. The first thing is I got to pay Social Security and income tax. And that's the big thing. And then maybe I have a little money for marketing. So make up something like this and use it because they don't understand where that big dollar goes that they see they're paying you because they think you're getting $100,000 commission on the sale and they don't see that there's three other people eating the pie. So I want you to do that. I have buyers who say, you know, I don't want to get tied up with an agent. Okay. I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't want to get tied up with them either. So if, if they're not willing to buy and they're not willing to do everything that's necessary to buy in this market or any market, I don't want to be tied up and I tell them that, you know, I've been married before that didn't work. So I uh, don't need to be tied up at all. So I'm way too busy to bug you, but I am never too busy to give you good service. And that's what I tell them. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to chase you. I'm, I'm too busy for that. But if you sincerely want to buy a house, then I'm here to help. And that's how I get them to commit that to me, whether they're serious or not. Are they just, you know, interested in seeing a few houses because they think houses are pretty? No, I'm not the Uber driver. Down here, they like to prey on things and sleep on it a lot. I don't know about up there, but once you get down south, that's what happens. So I always tell the buyer, you know, if you want to sleep on it, it's okay with me as long as you don't get upset if you're not able to sleep in it because somebody else is going to buy it. Now, in today's market, they understand that better than they ever have before. In years past, they thought it was always going to be there and be ready for them. Um, the other thing is that with the sellers also, you need to get back into what are your real concerns because it's not the price. It's I've got to move. I had wanted to move to St. Louis. They really wanted to close here and stay in the house for a week or two till they could close in St. Louis because they had children and just make a door-to-door -door move. That was more important to them than the price that they got for the house. So we need to be asking those questions. And in the end, I just want to leave you with this. You cannot change reality. This is the market. This is the way it is. All you can do is manage their expectations. One of our problems is, is we get too involved and too caught up personally in whatever the buyer's or seller's situation seems to be. And we seem to make it our problem. And, and we've all dealt, if you don't do it yourself, we've all dealt with agents who do. And we can't do that because we're professionals. We're here to help them. We're not here to make decisions for them. That's their, my job, I tell them, is to give you the information, keep you from stepping on the alligator. Your job is to pick a house or decide on your price, whichever. And then my job, once all that happens, is to get it to closing. So I'm not going to push you to do anything. You do whatever it is you want to do. And if it's at all possible, I'm going to help you do it. So don't get caught up in everybody's personal things because that doesn't get you anywhere. You know, uh, I had a seller not too long ago talk to me about selling his mother's house and he was all upset and he's so emotional about it and he wants a price even in this market we can't get. And so I just finally said to him, you know, I can understand how you feel. So you use feel, found, and felt. I felt that way when I had to sell my mother's house. But in the end, the buyer doesn't see any emotion. And I've never seen an appraisal in all my years in real estate that had a line item for emotional value. So unless Elvis slept here or, or Michael Jordan has been around or Michael Jackson 
was there, or maybe George Washington, I don't know if that's politically correct today, came about, it's not going to happen. Now, where you guys are, I know if the pilgrims landed and slept in the house or camped out on the ground, it might be worth something more. But there's nothing in an appraisal for emotional value. So you just have to deal with the stuff as it comes to you and try to answer as best you can and understand you can't help everybody. You know, sometimes selling real estate's like fishing. They're not all keepers. Sometimes they just, they can't do what they want to do. And you have to just say to them, you know, maybe next year would be a good time for you to do this. Because right now with this market, it's not going to work. And just be honest with them. Don't, don't keep trying to help them when it's not possible to help them. If they're not more willing to help themselves than you are to help them, then don't work with them. Because they have to be more committed than you are. So, you know, you, do you all know the difference between committed and involved? Looks like I got here just in time. So the next time you eat breakfast, I want you to think about this. The pig was committed and the chicken was involved. So think about that. You order your eggs and bacon. That's how I want you to think about these buyers and sellers. How committed are they? Are they just simply kind of involved? If somebody from California comes to Pensacola, and wants to pay me a million six for my $400,000 house, I will sell it. All right? Those people aren't even involved. They're in Never Never Land. So if they're not committed to the outcome, if they're not committed to doing what's necessary on buyer or seller side, then everybody's wasting their time because you cannot move them off dead center if they are not committed. And I know that Every one of us have worked with people like that before. The big difference is in learning how quickly you can cut loose and move on to somebody that's really interested in doing something. Because if they're not interested, you're spinning your wheels. It's kind of like you can't date somebody who doesn't want to date you. I mean, that, that's just how it is. And if they don't want to do what's necessary, then you don't have a date. You have an acquaintance. So I just want you to think about those things. Don't get scared over scripts and dialogues. They're just answers. We've been given answers all of our life. We've had to memorize all kinds of things, Pledge of Allegiance, the Lord's Prayer, whatever it is. And, and scripts and dialogues are no different. Just causes us to respond quicker with a pre-planned answer that works most of the time. Does that help? That is amazing, Alexis. I've, as always, I have a list of questions, but I want to make sure I get to everybody else. And I want to make sure we also promise that we will not call our buyers pigs, but we will keep that in our minds, that that's what we're looking for. Wow, well, I didn't <laughs> say that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, we're not, I'm saying we will not do that. But when we talked about pigs and chickens, we want the pigs, but we will not call anyway. So... Um, um, but let me open this up to some questions, please, because I'm sure there was some stuff that bubbled up for folks. Um, love to hear what you guys all have to say. I, I don't have a question. Um, I just want to thank you for all of the, all of that because uh, it's very valuable. Um, I wish I had it before I just divorced this this buyer I had, or they divorced me. It was an awful, awful, awful situation. But um, now I'm armed for the next one. I tell you the truth, the, the best dialogue for doing that is to just simply say, you know, I think we've both done our best here in trying to make things work. And it just doesn't look like it's working out. So I don't want to tie you up. I'm sure there's probably another agent who can help you better than I can. So let's part friends. And if you have questions or anything, just feel free to give me a call mm -hmm. and just get right out of it in a pleasant way. 
I know sometimes you just want to say, oh, God, you want to choke them to death, but you can't do that. Um, and, you know, so you just got to find a, a good way to bow out and, and move on. Because at the end of the day, you can't help them. And then maybe they don't want to be helped. Maybe there's no hope for them. You don't know uh, with some of them, you know, and particularly with sellers, again, when they get a, a price on their minds that came from God knows where, you know, oh, Zillow said I could get X for my house. And, you know, I had this last year and I said to the seller, really? Zillow was at your house? And they just kind of looked at me like they're in headlights. And I said, I don't know that Zillow's ever been in anybody's house. I don't know how they can set a value without even knowing your neighborhood. I mean, Zillow's an al algorithm. If Zillow was the do-all, be-all, the banks wouldn't require an appraisal. We just use Zillow. So I think you better pay attention to the sales in the neighborhood and not Zillow. Yep, for if sure. If you want to stop here and call your banker and ask if they'll take Zillow, I'll be glad to wait. <laughs> so other questions for Alexis. I want to mention that a couple of amazing takeaways. I love that question that Alexis mentioned. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked that would really, that, that could impact how I, I, I help you? That's a great question. And I definitely want to make sure I, I, you know, put that into everything that I'm doing. Cause that is just, I, I love that. I love, I mean, it really was amazing. And also um, that slide that you had about things that don't affect your price. You took it off really quick. I did a screenshot though. That was excellent <laughs> because that's what's on the table, you know, and just getting it, it, having a slide or having part of the presentation be, oh, I got this from an agent colleague of mine in Florida and it's, it really resonates. And, and I actually like have it be someone else. How much you paid for it, how much you want for it, how all those things that, you know, really may, will not affect your price. And that upgrades help your property show better and maybe sell faster, but may not help you get more money. I've never heard it said that way, Alexis. That was just brilliant. I just want to call out that as well. I thought that was really great. Can I share yeah. something else about value? So mm -hmm. I had a few years back, a young man wanted to make an offer on a house that was an estate. He wanted to make a low offer. And I said, but, you know, we can make the offer. It doesn't matter to me. If you don't care if you buy it, I don't either. Uh, because they're going to get upset, but we'll make the offer. And he kept saying, but, you know, uh, it's an estate, therefore they should take less. And I said to him, okay, so they got it for nothing because grandma died and left it to them. So why are you even ask, offering them more money? Why don't you just ask them to sell it to you for a dollar? That would be more than what, the, what they paid for it, if that's your theory. And he kind of grinned and I said, you see, it doesn't work that way doesn't make any difference what they paid for it. What if they bought it at the height of the market in 06 and they paid 200,000 for it? Today it's worth 150. Are you going to give them 200 because you feel sorry for them? And then he backed up. So just think about those things. What they paid for it has nothing to do with anything. All right, Kurt, you had a question? Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. And Alexis, I just wanted to thank you. It is thank always her. a pleasure to sit in your classes. You are such an incredible wealth of knowledge. Um, thank you for the techniques and the scripts as well. We're starting to see that with the sellers thinking of the market six months ago and the buyers thinking of the market that will be coming in two years and neither of them have realistic expectations. So the timing was very, very timely for this information. Thank you so much for being here with us. You're welcome. My pleasure. I'm always happy if I can help. And I also know that there are people listening who say, oh my God, that's a ditzy old broad. I could never say those things. So I'm going to say, stop. Yes, you can. You can put it in your own words and say it according to your personality. Mm -hmm. And you get the point across. They get it. Trust me, they get it. Uh, you know, and you can get it across just like the example I gave you by me asking that young man questions. I didn't answer his question. You know, I came from a Jewish grandmother and you never got an answer to a question. You, you got another question. And so, you know, finally after 10 questions, you're like laying on the floor with your tongue hanging out. All you wanted to do is say, you know, Nana, do you want to go to the mall? And 20 questions later, She's got the whole story on why I'm going, what I'm doing, who's getting married, why they're getting married, where the wedding is. 
and just because she asked questions and she didn't make a statement. So, and you know, I'm sure that this is not just Jewish grandmothers. I'm sure if you're Italian, if you're, you know, any kind of ethnicity, that, that's how it works. I mean, God made them that way. That's how grandmas are. Yeah, Lisa, you had a question? Thank you. I do. Go right ahead. Hi, Alexis, good to see you. Good to see you. Very too. quickly, because I love the, the Alexis. Here we go. Um, seller says on a listing appointment, he lives in the neighborhood. He's got every reason to want that listing. He always sells things so quickly because he just wants to get the deal done, but he's going to charge me one, per, one apple less. What's your response? So the other agent lives in the neighborhood? Yep. Okay. So I would say, you know, life is about choice, Lisa, and you can do whatever it is you want to do. So what you just said to me is the person in the neighborhood, though, always sells the house for less. So I'm curious as to why you want to put the house with somebody who isn't probably going to get you the full market value and then just pay them less. So I, I don't understand that way of thinking. Can you explain to me what causes you to think that way? Don't answer. You're the seller. Answer me. Yeah, he's just going to get it done, and I know I'm going to pay less. So if I have a buyer who's willing to pay you less for the house right now, you'd undersell it? Because I can make a phone call and get Love somebody it. in. Is that what you're saying? Because if you want to undersell it, I got somebody to lender buy it. I like that part. Yeah. And I get them to answer me. Because they're not going to say they are. And then I say, I'm curious. We're talking about 1%. So we're talking about, let's say, $4,000. I don't know what the numbers are where you are, right? And yet you're willing to sell the house for less. So you're going to save $4,000, and then you're going to shave ten or twenty off the price. Somehow or another, my math isn't that good. So... I'm sure that makes sense to you, but I'm trying my best to understand. Can you explain how that makes sense? Yep. I basically did what you just did. She's listing with him anyway. I told her I can get you 40. I said, my bar starts here. His listing price starts here. So if I'm already 30 or $40,000 different, I'm easily going to save you that 1% plus. And it just never got through. Or you say, you know, I can do that. And if I sell it for more than what he's going to sell it for, then you can afford to pay me the other 1%. I think that's a great idea. Let's put that on the contract. Because you'll have more money to pay me. Yeah. Right? Fine. It doesn't matter. The math is the math. Work it out. So you could always do that. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, I'll do it for the X, but if I get more than, than what you're going to list it for over there and I get you Y, then, then and only then do you pay me the difference. Now I'm going to take that chance. And, you know, in the end, like I said, they're not all keepers. Yeah. You just have to let it go and move on. You know, I mean, you got to kiss a few frogs to get to the prince. And, and that's how you have to look at it. So true. Now, Thank you. I, I would have left my card and say, well, I know you're going to list with X, Y, Z, but you know what? There's another side of real estate that you can help me with. Why don't you send me some of your friends' as referrals? You know, you're moving to Timbuktu. I got a good agent there. Then you list with them and I'll refer you to a good agent out of town. I always think there's more real estate services that you can offer. Yep. Great. Appreciate it. Well, we're a couple of minutes over our time. And does anyone else have a burning question they want to throw out? If not, I will say thank you so much, Alexis. As always, it is such a pleasure to spend time with you. We hope our paths cross again soon. Probably see you in San Diego. Hope everyone will be uh, in at celebration in Phoenix in March. And uh, Christine put the link for our 2022 installation in the chat box. That will be virtual on December 2nd from 4 to 5.30 p.m. 
And our keynote is Elizabeth Mendenhall. We're very excited and honored about that. So we hope to see you there. And as always, we, uh, we appreciate your time very much. And thank you so much for joining us on Mastermind Monday. Well, hopefully Have a great you'll week. invite me when we can get an in-person meeting. I'd love to yes. come back to Cape Cod. We sure will. Yeah, we sure will. Alexis, we'd day. always like to see you face to face. Who is that? That's Nelson's right. Nelson. Oh, Nelson. Oh, my God. I don't. Nelson, I don't know if I want to see you face to face, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I love you so much. We both have the same Jewish grandmother. That's why. That's exactly right. <laughs> now have I'll a see you in a couple weeks. Uh, see you in a couple weeks. Next week. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.